Sure. So, Kwe Nabi Boaja Kwe and Dijnakas, Makwa and Dorum, Kitikansi B Nishnabe and Jinjiba, Nishnabe Kwe and Dao. I'm Kalinda Klein. I'm really honored to be here and in conversation with uh, my friend, uh, Christy Belcourt, and talk about her beautiful artwork. And uh, I'd like to to start by doing the way we should always start when we're gathered together, even if we're in a virtual space. It's, it's a little odd because we're not all gathered on the same land, but uh, the exhibit that the pieces that we're talking about tonight are from the Art Gallery of Guelph and uh, Christie's exhibit that she has with Isaac Murdoch called Uprising. And so we're in Guelph and we're acknowledging the land here. We're, we're talking about uh, the Anishinaabekwe, um, the ancestral and treaty lands of the uh, Michisagi um, Anishinaabe. Uh, currently, you might know them as Mississaugas of uh, New Credit. And we have to acknowledge that, that these are the folks um, who have the inherent rights on the lands where we are meeting and where many of us are uh, living and uh, working. So we have to think about who are the folks who have always been here and have those rights. And then what is our responsibility uh, to the folks who are the inherent right holders? So if you're thinking about what you can be doing, what are you doing uh, to be in relationship with people uh, from the community? What are you doing um, to take care of the land in their absence while they're not here? Because in Guelph, we are, uh, we are a little bit removed uh, from the First Nation, but not we're on their um, treaty lands. So think about how do you, are you in relationship with folks and what is your responsibility um, to the reconciliation? So miigwech. Thanks, Kalinda. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Shauna McCabe. I'm the director of the Art Gallery of Guelph. Um, I would also like to offer a land acknowledgement on behalf of the Art Gallery of Guelph, who is hosting this dialogue tonight. And um, Kalinda used the word responsibility, and cultural institutions have a cultural a, a responsibility as well, um, as a land acknowledgement really confronts the institutional leg legacies of colonialism. Not only have cultural institutions used deeply colonial methods to represent different communities, uh, like Indigenous communities historically, but because of the authority that they have, these narratives have been accepted as truth, uh, becoming destructive policies that negatively affect Indigenous peoples. So we offer, offer this land acknowledgement to recognize the ongoing effects of settler colonialism. Guelph is situated on treaty land uh, that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people today. And as we gather here this evening, we would like to acknowledge that the Art Gallery of Guelph resides on the ancestral lands of the Atawandran people, and more recently the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant to this land, and offer our respect to our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. We express our gratitude and recognize our responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work. Also, uh, as Kalinda noted, we're not in a place, actually, <laughs> many of us tonight. Um, we're gathered virtually tonight, connected and yet physically dispersed. And so it's a good moment to uh, really reflect on the meaning of place at this time of distance and in doing so recognize how the different traditional lands we reside in and move through every day as we uh, go about our lives really inform our lives and we acknowledge the elders past present and future of these lands with gratitude and respect i'd also uh, it's my privilege actually to introduce our guests tonight um, our panelists uh, christy belcourt and kalinda klein um, Many of you know Christy and uh, Kalinda already, um, and this talk is presented, as Kalinda mentioned, in conjunction with an exhibition that's on view at the Art Gallery of Guelph that features Christy Belcourt's work called Uprising, the Power of Mother Earth. And this is a mid-career retrospective of Christy's work. Uh, so tonight we'll be talking about her art in relationship to land-based practices that are also very important to, to Christy and how they support environmental and social justice. 
Uh, Michif Métis artist Christy Belcourt is currently based in Anishinaabe territory on the North Shore of Lake Huron. Uh, in many ways, she's an environmentalist and advocate for the lands, waters, and indigenous peoples, and a founding member of the Onaman Collective. She's also the project creator and coordinator of Walking With Our Sisters, a community-driven project honoring mur murdered and missing indigenous women. And much of her recent artwork focuses on revitalizing indigenous culture, language, and land-based knowledges while drawing attention to environmental impacts of resource extraction and climate change. I'm also pleased to introduce Kalinda Klein. Uh, Kalinda has been an educator for over 25 years. Um, she's Anishinaabe and based in Guelph, where she is the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit curriculum lead for the Upper Grand District School Board. Um, and she's very uh, interested in providing a space for Indigenous histories and Indigenous voices. She also hosts Anti-Racism Educator Reads, which is a weekly podcast um, that focuses on um, racial and social justice. Kalinda also serves on the Art Gallery of Guelph's Board of Trustees. Um, two details for everyone um, who's attending. This event is being recorded. As well, um, if you have a question, there's a Q&A uh, section at the bottom of, the, of your screens in Zoom. So please you, uh, direct your questions to the Q&A um, posting area and we will deal with those at the end of the discussion. Thank you and I will turn it back to you, Kalinda. Christy, would you, would you like to say a few words before we get started? Yeah. Introducing yourself? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in tonight uh, to uh, listen to me have a conversation with my friend Kalinda. Uh, it's always a lot. It's always a real pleasure to be even virtually in the same room as Kalinda. Uh, we, we've worked together and um, I was present at her, her naming ceremony uh, when she got her name and that was a very proud moment uh, for her. Uh, filled with lots of tears and emotion uh, as they normally are. And I want to thank uh, Shauna and the Art Gallery of uh, Guelph for hosting um, Uprising, uh, the retrospective. I've seen a lot of people posting and tweeting about it. And uh, I just want to say that I'm really grateful for uh, gallery spaces that are willing to um, host artworks and themes of Indigenous artists who have maybe some, uh, I would say, some things to say that, that don't exactly go along with uh, where the Canadian state wants to move in terms of the environment. And so uh, I just want to acknowledge um, and my gratefulness to the Art Gallery as well for, for having my exhibit there. Uh, I know it's going to be closing pretty soon, which is too bad, but, uh, but, I, but I appreciate the time that it's been there. So I'll just leave it there and then I'll turn it back over to you, Kalinda, and we'll, we'll start our, our conversation. So welcome everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christy. I agree. I'm, I'm happy to be in this space and it's been too long. And uh, how we're going to set this up is have a slideshow of some of the pieces from the exhibit because we know that people are from all over the place and so you may not be able to get to the Art Gallery of Guelph. Uh, this, it was exciting for me to see this exhibit at the Art Gallery of Guelph because I had also seen it at the Thunder Bay Art Gallery. And I, I love seeing exhibits in different spaces because there's a totally different feel um, to the, the pieces and which ones end up taking center stage end up uh, changing in, in different places. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. Okay, I'm hoping that everyone can see my screen. So I was thinking about what Shauna started talking about place. And, and I think uh, particularly in this time that we are all very aware of place uh, in a different way than we maybe were uh, pre-COVID. And this is a, an early one of your pieces, uh, Wiki Bay from Mary's Teepee. And I, I love how there's, there's already uh, this, uh, the, few, the beauty of the water uh, showing up in your work. And I was wondering if you could just talk about your sense of um, place, water, what your feelings were as we go through a couple of these pieces that I think are really tightly connected. 
So this one obviously was painted all, almost 20 years ago now. Uh, when I look at it, I think, oh my God, that's uh, such an early piece. <laughs> uh, my dad, uh, I gave this to my dad, so it normally hangs in his house, but as it travels around, he's, he's grateful to have it travel everywhere. Um, this painting was obviously at nighttime. Um, it was during the powwow weekend in, in Wakwemakong. And uh, Mary, Mary uh, Fisher and her family had a teepee out on the bay, and that's where we were staying. And when I looked out, out of the teepee, that reflection from the moon onto the water uh, really struck me. Uh, I, I've been, you know, out uh, camping or whatever uh, at nighttime and looking out at water and watching how the moon reflects and follows you everywhere. Um, you know, you get a really intimate um, relationship with that reflection, I think, uh, of the water and the way that the light dances across of it, across it. And as you're there in your own sort of silence underneath the stars, um, you really feel the immensity of this world of creation of life. Uh, and, and you also feel very incredibly humbled because you know that, you know, we're only here for a very short time. Uh, we only get the privilege of being alive just uh, like a blink of an eye really in the long the long 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 timeline of this earth and what a gift it is to be able to sit and watch the water and to know that all of that life is in the water and how much life we are given by the water and um, and to be under the the canopy of uh, of the stars and to feel that warm breeze in our face. You know, every moment is really precious. And so when I look at this piece, that just it takes me right back to those moments, all of them, when I've sat at nighttime on a clear night underneath the stars and watched the reflection of the moon. I appreciate that, uh, that feeling too. And as someone who lives in the city, uh, it's not very often that I, I get to look up and see a sky that looks uh, like this with all of the stars. And I, I, I've had a couple, only a couple of moments this summer where I had that opportunity. I know, know exactly how, what you're talking about. Um, we're, working, we're working through the water, um, water theme. And with this one, uh, we have a little bit of a poem as well, because some folks may not know um, that you are uh, also a writer and um, also a musician. That some people like those; those might be secrets that not everyone knows about, but it's out there now. Uh, so I just would like to read this one: Water has no flag, water knows no race. The earth's belly grew of sun and moon and stars until her waters broke, and all of creation took its first breath, crying out, "Glorious is life." into the four directions. Can you speak to, to these pieces? Um, well, as we've seen um, in the last, uh, I don't know, it's been happening quite for quite some time, water work, water walks, water advocacy, um, and the, it, mostly led by Indigenous women who are astutely aware of the importance of water um, to our lives. Um, of course, we carry our babies in water in our wombs. Uh, the water that comes down from the skies, it recycles up into the skies again and falls down. And there's no drop of water that exists in this world that hasn't somehow made it through everybody's, you know, through everything all the time. Uh, we're, we're, we're literally made of water. And so without clean water, without water on this, on this earth that's uh, kept pristine and clean, there's no guarantee that, that the future generations will be able to survive or the future generations of any species will be able to survive. And so we always wonder if the species that are uh, going to be born in the next 500 years or so are going to have clean water to, to, to drink when they, when they come out as little babies, you know, the baby birds and the baby bears and you know, when you think about 200 years and we ask the question, will they have clean water? Uh, the trajectory that we're on on this earth right now is the answer. 
if we ask the question, will they have clean water in 500 years? Will people have clean water? Will animals and everything have clean water? The answer is no. And so we're also watching multinational corporations uh, push their way with their greed agenda, um, okay, sort of kind of hidden under the guise of democracy and, uh, and they promote capitalism, with, which is proving to be a failure for the earth in the sense of that it promotes insatiable growth, which is simply not sustainable. And so there are um, many of these multinational uh, oil and gas companies that are pushing pipelines through territories um, with which they have no permission to go through or where they may have gotten sort of some pseudo permission um, to go through those territories, but where the people themselves are rising up and saying, hold on a second, like this river has sustained our people for thousands of years. And it, it's simply um, asinine and insane to want to put a pipeline through this river or through our lake. Or um, right now the NWMO is trying to bury nuclear waste near Ignis. And um, we everybody knows that that's going to get into the water at some point. Um, you know, nuclear waste has a shelf life of 100,000 years. It's unfathomable that if they're going to be able to keep that contained without ruining um, the future. And, uh, and so Indigenous women, Indigenous people are standing up and saying, no, you can't do this. And it's kind of a David and Goliath sort of um, situation where we're we're seeing, you know, these multinational corporations who are backed by governments who are using uh, and increasingly militarized police forces to force their way through. Uh, they're calling people who want to protect their land and waters terrorists, um, and which are mostly indigenous people who are being criminalized for wanting to just stand up uh, for their lands and waters. And, um, and yet they're putting a hero status onto people who are actually um, for the destruction of the earth. And so there's a several pieces that I've done recently uh, along these lines of, um, of people standing up for the water, praying for the water, of course, in the water walks and the people who are doing that work. Um, spiritually and ceremonially, people are singing, singing the water songs, uh, you know, and there's, there's great stories of historically of our nations, um, within our nations of, of things like people marrying a beaver or, uh, you know, marrying a mermaid and, um, you know, being taken by the little people and being taught things about the water and there's serpents and thunderbirds. And there's all sorts of things within our mythologies that tell us that we have a very deep spiritual and long-standing connection to water and the beings that are within water. So this piece in particular with her carrying a fish is um, sort of a, a nod or an ode to that uh, older way of thinking, which I think is not really old, it's just not really talked about too much. And it should probably be more revitalized in the sense of we have relationships and treaties with species and with other beings um, that predate the treaties that we have, or that I shouldn't say we have, I'm, I'm not um, treaty, but um, that uh, First Nations have with, with uh, non-Native people. There are treaties um, that Indigenous nations have with, with each other and with other species that predate those treaties. And somehow we never seem to talk about those. I, I love the connection here of the woman when she's of singing with the drum and into the baby fish in her belly and right into the water. And, and for me, um, I have been um, fortunate to have been uh, gifted the permission to sing a number of different water songs. And so whenever I'm at the water and singing one of those songs, uh, this is the image that, that comes to my mind. So I wanted to say a big chi miigwech for that because I just, I just love this, this image. The, the one other thing that you were talking about that, that I was thinking I'd like to unpack a little bit more before we move on is this uh, idea that you, when you talked about capitalism and, and that 
what I don't always see us having the conversations when we're talking about environmental justice and we're talking about racial justice, also talking about capitalism and that uh, the, how uh, the connection is, is so clear and yet it's not always um, part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? How do we make that part of the conversation? How do we ensure that that becomes part of the conversation? Well, I think we have to, I think what, you know, what, in my, my uh, opinion, which isn't always right, of course, uh, I think that we have to start to have these conversations in ways that are non-judgmental. We're all caught in this capitalist, uh, you know, nightmare. <laughs> and uh, where, you know, uh, products and things are wrapped in three layers of impossible plastic that will never biodegrade. And uh, we're we're just we're caught in this in the same way. Uh, we we can't seem to escape it. And there's a lot of uh, pressure put on consumers, um, aka us, to stop consuming things that are plastic. But yet there is no pressure put on the manufacturers and to do that. And so this idea of insatiable growth has been um, sort of tied in and married and melded in with the same concepts of philosophy uh, and uh, democracy and uh, patriotism. So because it's sort of been tied in with this idea of patriotism and uh, democracy, the minute you talk about capitalism as being a bad thing, people get very defensive and talk about, you know, patriotism and democracy along the same lines. And then they always say, well, what's the alternative? Do you want fascism? Do you want c communism? Those are failed. Do you want this? Do you want that? And so if people's imaginations need to be ignited into what can be possible outside of the existing samples that have failed, and this one is failing. Um, and, and I think in the future, um, whenever that may be, way down the line, long after you and I are gone, um, there will be conversations had about how democracy failed the same way as people are speaking about it in terms of communism right now. And I think that, um, I think that we, it's inevitable uh, because the earth simply cannot sustain this. And uh, I think that when we're talking about capitalism, it really is one and the same with democracy in the way that it's all been tied together. And unless people are able to unpack that and untangle it, uh, for themselves, it, 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 both of them are going to go down together. And so we have to reimagine what the world could look like um, in a place where uh, the vulnerable are, are not vulnerable, you know, and where there is no poverty, um, the, where the military doesn't get the bulk of budgets and where people have a right to say no. Uh, to projects that affect their lands and waters. And, you know, there's, there's a whole host of things that we could it, reimagine the world to be a better place and reimagine the continent, this continent to be a better place where Indigenous peoples have our land back. And, um, you know, th those kinds of things are, are conversations that we could have and have these imaginings and ignite people's imagination on, on what that would look like rather than just saying it's not going to work because of this or because of that and because the only alternatives are ones in history that have failed already and that, that's simply not true um you know there are like as many colors in the in the universe as there are possibilities and we can imagine a different path forward actually we must well speaking of reimagining and my absolute favorite um, painting of yours, um, because I have such a close personal connection um, to this one, Revolution of Love. Can you speak to it? Um, well, of course, this is a depiction of uh, the late um, Josephine Mondamenban, and she um, led a revolution which is still unfolding in the sense of she 
she and her sister, and I think there was maybe another who decided to to walk. A water walk, they would carry the water in a copper pail and they would um, have an eagle staff and, and walk for the water. And they saw this coming a long time ago. And so they started to walk for the water and pray to the water um, all around the Great Lakes. And she made it herself. She walked um, the entire distance around every single Great Lake. Uh, she went, you know, I think she began with Lake Superior, if I'm not mistaken. I can't, I can't recall. But then she did, each year she did a new Great Lake uh, where she organized a water walk. And as she started to organize these water walks, other people started to see what she was doing and either join in with hers or st begin to do water walks around their own bodies of water. And what that involved was them walking um, with a pail of water that didn't stop. So when you went on these water walks and it was your turn to sort of take, like they would relay, you know, and uh, as you would walk up to the person to take the pail of water from them or the eagle staff, the eagle staff always went with the water and the water would lead a little bit. And um, and then as the water, as you took the, the pail of water, you had to keep on going, you couldn't stop. The water continually had to keep moving. And, uh, and then, as you were going, you also had to put tobacco in the in water bodies of water that you would come across and pray for that water, and uh, pray for the future. Put your good intentions into the water for the, all of the future generations to come. And it was a very sacred ceremonial. Um, it was a ceremony, and uh, so what she started really was a revolution. And I came across this um, article a really long time ago with, um, I guess they were interviewing Mother Teresa and they asked her, uh, somebody asked her, would you come to our anti-war anti, anti -war rally? And she said, no, but if you make it for peace, I will be there. And that really um, resonated with me in the sense of I thought, well, that is so true. When you make something for something, it's so much more powerful than if you do something that's against. Um, and when you think about what is it that you, I remember a lot like, oh my God, I was in my late teens and this guy, he said, well, you sure are against a whole lot of stuff, but what do you, what is it that you want? <laughs> you know what you don't want, but what is it that you want? And I had to really think about, think about it. You know, when we focus ourselves to think what it, what do we want rather than what we don't want? It's a, it's kind of even a harder question to answer sometimes. It's very easy to pick out what we don't want and harder to say what we do. And so if we want to be for clean water, we want to the future generations to have a clean, clean planet, clean air, clean water to be born into the future generations of all species, then, then that is a pretty heavy um, ask. And it requires, it's going to require all of us to step up to do something for the water. And so when I think about revolution of love, I think of how Josephine and everyone who participated in, in the water walks and did all of that work so humbly and, and unheralded, you know, um, they did all that work for all of us. And now it's our turn and our responsibility to pick that up and to continue it on. Um, we have to do this because the young people in this world are saying that they have no hope. Young people are saying that they don't see any hope for a future and a planet that's going to, that's going to survive. That is completely shocking. You know, anyone who's my age and older never had to have that heaviness of that burden that they had to carry. When we're thinking of love, you know, you, when you watch anything um, like any documentaries on the oceans. And when you go out onto the, onto the land yourself and you stand by a body of water, everybody in this world has little spots that they love. You know, little private, little private spots on this earth that only they kind of know about. And, and it's a place that they really love to be. And we think about all of the love that mothers have for their children and have put into their children. We think about the love that 
that the spirit world has for us. We think about all of the love that we are that's going around the world. Well, it's a revolution for love, and it's the revolution for the future that we're in. And when we think of it like that, then the fear kind of goes away and the anger goes away. And I have to think about energy and how, um, you know, if we're, if we're engaged in fear over the future and engaged in um, worry and stress about what's going to, what's going, what might be the future, then that's the energy in an um, unconsciously maybe and uh, that we're unintentionally putting out into the world. And so it's important to refocus our energy into being for something that's positive and to manifest that feeling and that, that energy within us to be able to put that into the world to counter all of the hate that's going on. Because right now that, that, that hatred and that negativity and all of the awful things that we see are kind of taking over. And, um, and so we, we need to find an antidote for it. And, and oftentimes the antidote is the opposite of, what, of what's happening. And so we need to uh, refocus ourselves into having positive thoughts and putting intentionally like with our, with our minds and our, our good minds and our hearts to put that forward into a way that, that leaves something for the future generations. But it also requires work. And Josephine showed us that. She showed us that it requires um, people doing the work and it's not easy to organize water walks it's not easy to walk around the lake the great lakes for days on end um, it's not easy to make sure everybody has a place to sleep and that they're taken care of and there's food and there's water and people are not getting sick or stressed stressed out and um, all of that work um, it requires requires all hands on deck now for all of us it's not sufficient it's not good enough for us to sit back and, uh, and not engage. The, the young people are telling us to do it, that they want us to do it, that the earth is requiring us to do it. Uh, there's animals that cannot speak for themselves that need habitats and homes and they need protection. I walked uh, with Josephine on, on one of the walks, the one where she was going down the St. Lawrence um, and, and heading this way. And I would say one of the most beautiful moments for me ever would have been the moment where, because as you said, the water doesn't stop and it can't stop. And so I was walking with someone else, the man who was carrying the eagle staff and I was carrying to the bucket. And as it came to our relay turn, um, he had stepped away for a moment. And so then I had to take both and, um, and carry them. And it was, um, it was like being wrapped in love when you were talking about that, that, and it didn't feel like work at all for me because it was so important and that you know when something pulls on on your heart uh, that it just doesn't feel like work I could have walked uh, I felt like I could have walked for days uh, at, at that exact moment and so every time I see this particular painting I think of that I think of all of like you said the hard work that's involved in doing um, orchestrating something like a water walk and it's all done um, out of out of love, and I love too from this particular painting how you pull in different things that folks who um, have some of their teachings are going to pull more out of the painting than maybe someone else might. And so for me, that that's a really beautiful because there's so many different layers there, and um, and there are some things that that I I don't. I don't know if you think it's appropriate to speak to. I don't uh, because I, I don't have permission to, but I see some things here and it just, um, I could spend hours uh, with this particular painting. I don't mind speaking to them because they're in the painting and there was nothing hidden in the ways that we were doing things. Um, and there, there never really is. There's a beautiful openness about ceremonies. Um, I mean, I could speak to the, some of the objects that are in there, but I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't give teachings on how to sort of thing. But um, so, for example, um, the person carrying the eagle staff, or or the person behind carrying the eagle staff, also has a yellow cloth, and uh, inside it looks like a little bundle and uh, or a little round ball. I guess it looks like she's carrying something in this yellow cloth. And what we 
have seen everybody does it differently, but we make offerings to the water as we're as we're engaging in these ceremonies, and offerings are anything uh, that would be considered in a, it's not um, I don't know how to describe it. It's not an exchange. Offerings are not a payment. Uh, they're a petition. They're a request. They're a a, a, a begging of sorts um, in a humble way to say please help and um, and we know that that in our teachings which are pretty universal across I would say across all indigenous nations in North America that I've come across anyway um, uh, that it that there's always a give um, you have to give something um, in order to before you take something and you know, if you're picking medicines, for example, we give a little bit of tobacco um, or we give whatever. Um, if we're entering into ceremony and we're asking for, for something in that ceremony, we, we give something. Um, and it keeps everything in balance. It's, it's a spiritual giving. It may manifest in the physical world in terms of you're giving something physical, uh, but, but it's actually the, the acknowledgement comes from the spirit world to see that you've made the effort to give. And that, that's where the exchange comes in and that's where keeping things in balance comes in. So in her hand is the yellow cloth. The yellow cloth is a nod or an ode to the, um, to the moon, full moon ceremonies that are happening, um, which are also being led and done by women. And these full moon ceremonies are also extremely powerful women's ceremonies. And so the, there's the full moon that's there again, reflecting on the water in the painting. Um, inside that bundle might be tobacco or it might be food or whatever and and so it's it's going to be offered to the water um, when we do our water bundles and our offerings that way we often people will take off their shoes and socks and they'll be standing in the water so in this case you see Josephine standing right in the water uh, there's a woman who's scooping up the water there's another person scooping up the water so they're Three of them are, are down there scooping the water. There's another one off to the right, uh, a lady, with, uh, a woman who's pregnant and out of her hand is, you can sort of see it there, some little specks that's tobacco, that she's offering tobacco to the water. And then over on the other opposite side, the left-hand side, there's a younger uh, person there who's holding up the berries. And so as part of our ceremonies, we always have food and we always um, have berries as part of our ceremony. So she's holding up the, the berries. And then the um, animals that are painted on on each person is their clan. Uh, and then there's uh, another woman who's standing there holding her belly. She's pregnant, so she has two because her, baby's, uh, her baby is a bear clan inside her tummy. And, uh, and then there's the singers that are there and then the, the lots of other people. And of course, they're surrounded by by all of the, uh, they're in. The, they're basically in the water. I think that that's about. There's another person I can see holding berries there too, and then the eagle staff uh, that was that's carried in part of our ceremonies. Um, I think that that's about all I can sort of speak to in terms of what the what's in the content of the painting. Thanks, Christy. I love that. That was that was one of my favorite parts. That the the bear on the woman's belly. I love that. So I'm going to move on to the next one now. Here we go. Uh, so fish are fasting for knowledge from the stars. So we're still working our way through through talking about water. Um, can you speak to this one, this piece? Yeah, so um, my friend Isaac, I, for everybody, you probably already know who Isaac Murdoch is. Um, him and I uh, work together a lot, and we're we're really really close friends. And uh, he's he's a storyteller as well as an artist. And his stories um, are so engaging, and they bring you to other worlds. Like he's a very gifted storyteller. And so he was telling me about uh, I think it was sometime in January, and he was saying, "Oh, this is the time the fish are fasting." for knowledge and I'm like uh yeah you need to tell me about that because that's uh, just that alone made me like my imagination was going wild and he said yes the fish fast 
and they they hang upright and he says we're not supposed to to fish at this time we give them this this moment from one moon to the other moon uh so a, a full moon cycle where we where they're fasting and they hang up up upright like that in the water and they are are, are gazing into the stars there's a connection between the fish and the stars and um, and they're gazing into the stars for knowledge and he says when when they they gain all that knowledge uh when we do uh eat them we're uh, we're also eating that knowledge and that knowledge of the stars comes into our bodies and informs us and uh that was it was just a you know to to think that the fish fast um for knowledge from the stars is is such a i don't know it's a perspective and a window into a different way to see this world in a way that is so important to not forget the magic and the mystery the great mystery that that is here um that surrounds us at all times our oh, human species we we like to be we're pretty self-absorbed into our own our own doings <laughs> as humans and we forget i think sometimes that the magic and the mystery doesn't just extend to us in the moments that we choose to to observe it but it's going around us at all times you know that we are literally on a ball of water that is circling around a ball of fire out in space like we should all be in awe really that that there's so much more here than we will ever know as human beings there's so much more in this earth and on this planet um than we will ever ever understand and so we need to believe in that magic we need to believe in the little people we need to believe in the spirits that surround us we need to believe in things that are of higher power than ourselves and that we can um be appreciative and humble and grateful for this life and when we do that we walk in a different way a way that makes you naturally i think um not want to harm the earth because we realize it's not ours to harm it's not ours to uh to have control over or to manage thank you for talking about what a phenomenal storyteller Uh, Isaac Murdoch is. I think he's the best storyteller that I've ever heard. How often do you feel with your paintings are you inspired from story? Uh I don't know if I would say often. Uh it's really hard for me to gauge. Um there's been a few uh paintings that have been directly sort of riffing off of <laughs> some of Isaac's uh, stories that he's told and and uh and I think he's probably done the same with me <laughs> you know I'm not a storyteller but I but I'm sure that I'm I've influenced him sometimes and so uh I I don't know really if there's any that are directly off of stories in the way that this one is yeah uh so this one we're looking here the, this one the the detail is just a phenomenal so you're looking at all aspects of of the environment in the composition of of this painting I and mean, this is I certainly before I actually had met you uh, this style of your work is is what I had associated uh, with with your name and I'm wondering if you could speak to that yeah there's a lot I can say about these kinds of paintings so the one behind me here is about uh So I think it's about 8 or 9 feet wide by about 6 feet tall. Um and so this painting if this painting is a mirror is the same ap- approximately about the same size maybe a little bit smaller. And it's uh of course done in dots people know that already uh to emulate bead work. Um and so the symmetry um in paintings like this that I do on black is is comes from a very long uh history of what our ancestors our grandmothers our aunties uh, all of the bead workers in our in our families and in our communities uh in our nations left us so meti people have a very uh, long standing connection to floral bead work as a part of who we are in terms of our cultural inheritance i suppose and a lot of times 
the, the things that were beaded were uh, items that people would wear um, and, and what we would adorn ourselves with. And so that might be a moss bag that's made for a baby uh, or it might be a jacket or a vest. Um, um, it might be a bag of some sort. So moccasins, of course, mufflucks and, and things like that, uh, horse, horse blankets and dog blankets and uh, everything was adorned with beadwork. And so the, the, when people were making their patterns, of course, they would make two sides to match. And so a lot of the work that I do now is sort of emulating that um, symmetry to sort of pay homage to the, the traditional beadwork um, of, of, of my people. And with the black, it's also um, when trade cloth was, was introduced and there was a lot of black um, stroud, wool stroud or something, sometimes it's called Melton. Um, there was a lot of black and deep, deep blues and uh, mostly black and some reds. And those, that, that cloth was so highly prized uh, by people because it was warm and it was uh, sturdy and people would, would use it um, for all sorts of things. And, and also the beads would just, the colors would just pop off of that black. And so people, women really, really like the, like the black with the, with the beads on it. And I know with the, within the Anishinaabe uh, tradition, uh, these, these um, floral designs and the idea of using black and, and the same similar sort of like bright colors on the, on the black is also a tradition. And, and it, it was a, a kind of a uh, artistic tradition that crossed over into several, many different nations, uh, indigenous nations. And um, in this painting, there's about 200,000 <laughs> dots, I believe. Uh, and so the, the, I'm painting it in acrylic. It's acrylic on canvas. And um, what can I say? It's titled, um, this painting is a mirror because I want people to reflect um, the beauty that is within themselves, that they are the earth and the earth is them. And so when they look at that, at the painting, I want them to see themselves. So when I see people, I see the beauty that's within them. I see the, the, you know, the stars that they came from, the light that we are born from, and the spirit that exists within them. And uh, all of that is all part of the earth. We are all really just one. Everything is interconnected. Uh, there's not, you know, when we think about people are talking, they talk about uh, biodiversity and they talk about uh, ecosystems and how, uh, you know, you want, everybody was watching that thing on mushrooms not long ago, how the mushrooms are communicating and there's underneath with the root system and all of that. And, you know, when you think about the earth is sort of living, breathing. It's a living, breathing organism. And, and we are simply on this earth and everything is all connected. We are all part of this living, breathing planet. And there's nothing separate at all. And, and so we are literally the plants. We are the water. And the water is us and the plants are us. That's a good segue into this one too. The, the detail is just so spectacular in this one. And I love the, the way the colors pop on this cream color background too. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the honoring my spirit helpers. Yeah, this is, um, uh, everybody, well, in my belief anyway, everybody has you know, their grandmothers, their ancestors, um, other maybe spiritual beings that are around them that, that give them a hand sort of silently as little, little silent partners that help you out kind of thing. <laughs> and um, sometimes we don't realize that. Like one time I was uh, riding in this car, uh, it was my granny's car and it was old. And, uh, and I was going over this bridge, it was in Ottawa. And I was going over this bridge and 
there, I felt like there was somebody in the car and I looked, I looked in the rear view mirror and I was thinking, that's so strange. Like who is riding in the back seat here? And I just, I just felt like there was somebody there. It was like the weirdest feeling in the world. And then all of a sudden my axle broke. And uh, if I hadn't have sort of slowed down to look in the rear view mirror to say who is back there, um, uh, then I don't know, you know, maybe I would have went off the bridge, who knows. But uh, like, I'm not saying that that would have happened. I just don't, you know, you just don't know. There's a grand mystery here that we can't, we can't understand. So I believe that, that there's helpers around all the time. And sometimes in my paintings, I get stuck and I'll, I'll just sort of say, okay, please like help me with this color or help me with this something because I'm stuck here. And sure enough, you know, they always come through and give me a hand. So I, I don't do that often, but uh, so I wanted to make a painting that honored them. And um, it's, this painting is um, pretty large. So I think it's about seven feet tall by about 12 feet long, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, there's, there's a much longer story about the muskrat, you know, in creation, it's a creation story. Um, and then there's also uh, the seventh generation midwives purchased this. And so they like it because it's the roots look like the placenta on the, on the womb. And uh, they also, um, also the stones are like sweat lodge and then that dome is almost like a sweat lodge. So there's a lot sort of of references to spiritual or ceremonial practices here. And then that little um, perch that's in there was, I put her in there because I was out fishing and um, I, I, I caught the perch and I didn't really mean to um, because I was going after walleye. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, when I tried to take the hook out, it like, anyway, it was, well, it was not good. I was going to put her back in the water and, and I ended up, it ended up, she, she died. So I, I put her on the water anyway. And all of a sudden this massive eagle, like this wingspan was so huge. It came flying down and just scooped up that perch and went and sat up on the tree up by the, up by the shore and just started eating the perch. And and I was thinking, well, I'm so glad that this fish um, was able to nur you know, nourish, nourish an eagle. And so then I decided to put her in the painting to like recognize her life. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So that, that led into the, when you were just talking about the fish again, I, the detail on this one is just um, spectacular. And it almost uh, feels like um, the Australian, like a, like a, acknowledging the work that Australian Aboriginal folks do. Mostly, I think, because of the colors that are on there. Is there anything specific you'd like to, to talk to us about this one? Yeah, a, a lot of people say that, but that was really unintentional. <laughs> it was not, that was not, was not what I was meaning to do. But uh, I suppose that it, it just ended up doing that, uh, you know, because of the dots and stuff. And, and that's, that's pretty cool. But um, the sturgeon, so um, I had a dream that I was uh, in water and talking to a sturgeon and um, which is strange because I don't know anything about sturgeons and I never did know anything about sturgeons before this, this um, dream. And the sturgeon told me that she missed the frogs. And I, and I said, okay, I woke up and I thought, well, what, what, what on earth was that all about? Because up until that moment, I literally had no connections to fish at all. I wasn't fishing. I'm not, didn't live on a lake. I just, you know, I just never really thought about, about it. And, um, and then, so I thought, well, that's pretty powerful. That's definitely like in the realm of a spiritual dream rather than just a regular old, you know, eat a banana at midnight dream <laughs> and then you get nightmares you know you're not supposed to eat bananas at midnight did you know that that's that's uh that's what they say if you eat banana not midnight but if you eat bananas at night you get you get midnight i mean you get nightmares that's what they say so anyway um the the sturgeon um said that she missed the frogs so i started to uh google <laughs> good old google um, I started to Google, like, what is the connection between sturgeon and frogs? And I came across um, a website of the uh, Menominee Nation uh, who 
uh, that does sturgeon ceremonies. And I just read this little blurb that said the sturgeon will wait for the frogs to sing before they will come back to spawn. And I thought, well, why then am I having this dream about a sturgeon missing frogs? Like, why, why, is, why is she telling me this? And then I started to research some more and, and found out that sturgeons have to be 25 years old before they'll, before they'll lay eggs, um, that they have to have clean water, uh, and clean, clean shorelines to lay eggs in. They won't lay it where there's been development or dis disturb, disturbment of the, uh, disturbment, is that even a word? Anyway, um, where, the, where the shoreline has been disturbed and, uh, and they won't lay eggs in dirty water that um, most of the rivers that sturgeon would swim back to spawn in are um, blocked from dams for hydroelectric projects. And most of those rivers do not have fish ladders that are big enough for sturgeons to get back. Um, and so they continually, through their, their ancestral pull, I guess, uh, want to return to the places um, where they're supposed to, to lay their eggs and they're not able to. And I also heard that um, the wherever sturgeons, uh, I guess, habitats have been destroyed, it's also coinciding with where frogs' habitats are and are being destroyed. And so the idea that sturgeons and frogs have a relationship um, that has nothing to do with us humans, and it's not a predator-prey relationship at all, it's a, it's a, a very long uh, thousand thousands of year old relationship um, where the sturgeons wait for the frogs to sing. And, and if there's no frogs to sing, then how will they know, you know, uh, to come back to spawn? And, you know, sturgeons, uh, uh, they, they're caught for their caviar, uh, well, caviar for their, their eggs. And uh, they're, they're sold for 150 bucks a, a tin and uh, an ounce. And, you know, there's, there's a, a, a huge pressure on these really majestic fish. And um, in my opinion, people shouldn't be catching them at all um, because there's, they're, they're in decline. And, um, you know, we need to protect, we need to, we need to be able to allow the animals to speak to us in our dreams and then somehow have the courage to stand up for their, their homes um, and to protect their homes so that they can survive and, and their great, 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 great grandchildren will also have, have clean water and land to, to survive in. So a theme that, I, that I've noticed in, in your work is the listening to our more than human relatives and uh, that reminder that that comes out that we're how are, if we're going to have that future that you keep talking about we need to be listening and 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 i think that many of us are are good at uh, the talking part and not always so good at at the listening and i, I connect that to um the title of the exhibit of uprising and of of that listening um, the uprising with the the more than human relatives. Uh, what what is your connection to the the title of your of the exhibit? Well, I think I've been clear for a number of years that um, nothing short of of an uprising is going to is going to change things. The trajectory that we're on is not is not a positive one. Um, if we allow uh, multinational corporations to continually uh, control governments and and police forces. We are not going to end up in a good a good place. It's not a place that's going to be a just and fair place for for everybody. Um, and we've we've already seen that in full view these days. So uh, we absolutely need that for the earth. And um, it's I don't say that lightly. You know. Uh, talking about revolution is not a romanticized idea. It comes with a lot of suffering, but the alternative is suffering anyway. And so, like I was saying, we have to reimagine a future and work towards that and be courageous enough to, to stand up for that future that we want. 
Um, I do see that we're we're at the um, eight o'clock mark now, and there's a lot. There seems to be a few questions. Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure that I get to. Uh, I love. The, okay. We don't can talk to all about, but when we were just talking about the uprising, I wanted to make sure that some folks uh, who may be new to your work also know that in addition um, to all of the the beautiful paintings that you do, that that there's also been uh, this. Uh, banner work that you and, and Isaac have been working on. I'm wondering if you could uh, tell people a little bit about that because I, I, most folks may not know how uh, generous uh, the two of you are uh, with these particular images. Okay, um, well, uh, we started, um, Isaac made his lino cut of the Thunderbird woman. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've always been uh, like him and I were working on on these things uh, out of out of my home for a, a few days. And I've always been really attracted to that really stark black on white. And, um, and so we were sort of going in that direction and starting to do this work. And then all of a sudden Thunderbird woman came out and boy, was it ever powerful. And it just took off like wildfire. And um, Clayton Mueller Thomas uh, asked, yeah, the one on, on the left here where it says water is sacred, stop energy east. Um, there was a number of um, sort of uh, movements organized or protests organized around Winnipeg and, uh, and David Solnit from 350.org uh, were trying to get in touch with Isaac and saying, please, can we use your Thunderbird woman um, for our, our print screen printing? And we stopped by there. We happened to be passing through Winnipeg and we stopped by there and we started painting some banners and participating in this, in this uh, screen printing. And that, that began uh, our friendship with Clayton and with David. And, um, and then they sort of taught us how to do this. And as other communities were facing encroachment upon their lands and waters um, from multinational corporations, they, they wanted to also make banners and so we would travel around and and help uh, doing do this and we also would print sometimes 900 to 1000 banners and then we would ship them off to different frontline actions um, for their use uh, we've never charged anything for any of this at all we've always done done this work as a service to the community and to our our, our I guess our nations and uh, we've uh, We've also offered our images online for free, um, copyright free. We don't want any uh, names on it. We don't want any sort of uh, recognition or anything. And this is this is about us all fighting together for the same cause. And we have to do what we what we what we can to contribute. And you know, in we talked started this conversation talking about capitalism. And I think it is important for artists to copyright their works. Um, and, and naturally they have copyright over, over all of their works. The minute that they do their work, they own the copyright. Such are the copyright laws in, in Canada. But um, I also think that there's uh, a lot of room for us to be able to share uh, without worrying about, um, you know, when it comes to this kind of thing. We have to be able to like organize and unite without worrying about if somebody needs recognition for their artwork because that that's not it's not gonna it, it, it's um, it'll slow slow things down. You don't need anything when you're trying to organize uh, to stand on the front lines for an action. You don't need any sort of things coming in your way. And so uh, Isaac and I are really happy to be able to just say go ahead and use them if you want to use them. You know like put whatever messages you want on there, tailor the messages to your own community. Um, we, we've, we're redoing the website now, but we're gonna put it back up under ottomancollective.com and under our banner folder. And they're there for anybody to download. You can take them, use them uh, for whatever actions you want to protect your lands and waters where you're from, even change the language. It, you know, it doesn't have to be, you can wipe out what it says on there and put it in a different language whatever language you want to use them for. So we're, we're happy to, to have people use all of our images for free when it comes to water protection. And we also lend our images out for people to do their own fundraising for their own action because it costs money you know, to, 
to get the materials and to be out there. Uh, sometimes people need need to be taken care of in terms of food and water. You need to, you know, have some money to do a little bit of organizing. It's not much, but sometimes people need to raise some funds to keep going. And uh, so we lend our, our artwork for people to make t-shirts and sell them and do all that kind of stuff. Thanks. We can put it over to the questions now. I wanted to make sure that everyone uh, knew that because it's, uh, it's such a gift to all of us. So I'm going to turn it over to Shauna to uh, manage the questions for us. Hey everyone. <clears throat> okay, so we have a few questions. A lot of um, very just super positive comments, Christy, about your work in the exhibition. And we will make sure that you get a copy of, of these comments as well after uh, the webinar. Um, but some questions. Um, someone has asked, Debbie Reynolds has asked, I saw the exhibit today. Um, with a piece called Harvest, I noticed that the crows are outlined in red and other birds in blue, and I was wondering what the significance this serves. Um, none. <laughs> it's purely aesthetic. I just liked it. <laughs> and that, sorry, sorry there isn't any more deeper answer than that, but there's, there, there isn't. Um, the Fish and Stars work, um, Debbie would like to know, uh, could not find a, your name on this piece. Just wondering if there was a reason that you did not sign. I didn't sign it? Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know I didn't. <laughs> thanks, thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> um, so E.M. Williams, I love your work in its uh, own right and I very much admired your collaboration with Valentino and the idea of art being wearable. Would you ever consider collaborating with high-end designers again or indigenous, indigenous designers here in Canada? And forgive my ignorance if you have already done so. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely love to collaborate with indigenous designers um, inside Canada or outside Canada. It doesn't matter. Uh, I, I'm very, very much open to that. And um, I don't know if I would ever work with a... Uh, you know, one of the fashion houses, uh, one of the better known fashion houses again. Um, I didn't have a particularly bad experience with, with Valentino. Uh, it, it was just, um, I think in the end, there was no protection for my work from the knockoff, the knockoffs. So um, there was, there's multiple uh, sort of fake storefronts that, that are all over the place that present as being English speaking um, storefronts that are tailored to markets in North America. And um, those storefronts were offering, um, and when I say storefronts, I mean like those online storefronts that uh, sort of have no face or name. They, they sort of go under different company names and all this stuff and you can't really find anybody behind them. Uh, they were offering multiple knockoffs of the Valentino line uh, that we had collaborated on so uh, you know and in they had even taken liberty to sort of adapt some of those pieces into other designs but they basically took my art and put it all over these pieces and whenever I would like come across it I would complain and I would say okay you have to take this down you don't have copyright you can't do it and they would take that down on one site and then it would pop up on three other sites and so um, that that issue was uh, was the one that was discouraging. And Valentino was, you know, like me, I guess, we put up our hands sort of like, well, what can we do about it? Uh, because these are overseas companies that are just, you know, marketing this stuff all over and you can't really stop it once it starts. Right. So I, and, I, and I think that uh, it was, you know, it was, a, it was an okay experience working with them. Um, it wasn't as in depth as I would have liked it to have been uh, in the sense of like, I would have liked to have a longer type of a relationship with them to be able to do, um, it was it was fast, it was fast and furious, you know? And, and then I don't like that they appropriated native designs following our collaboration. Right. So I, I tried to guard against it by asking them, have you ever before? But I guess I should have said, will you ever in the future? <laughs> 
So, and I didn't ask that question, just assuming that they were like conscious of that kind of thing, and they weren't, and then uh, that was disappointing. But it, I mean, it was a fairly good, it was a good experience, but I would absolutely want to work with Indigenous designers for sure. Okay, um, there was also a question more about the composition uh, of your work. So what kind of paint brushes um, are you finding best for your, your work, uh, best for acrylics, and that give you the good control that you have when painting? Um, I'll, I will use anything at all, just about, except for student grade um, stuff. I never use, never use student grade paints and never use student grade paint brushes. They're just gonna end up being frustrating beyond belief. I use a lot of uh, script liners, so uh, Windsor & Newton makes some good ones. I even go on like, I think it's called Micromark something. It's like a, they make little mini machines for doing little mini, uh, what are those called? Like, you know, people that make little ships and bottles and stuff like and they make like miniatures and little miniature villages and like little things like that. Anyway, it's this this company called Micromark and they have all these, like they even have a little mini jigsaws, like the most amazing little things. I'm, I think it's so cute, but they also have these incredible paintbrushes that are very fine, very tiny script liners that will, you know, get the details. So you have to kind of search around for those. Um, but otherwise, uh, sable brushes are considered to be the best because they hold the paint well, everything is smooth when you're using them. I like using rounds as opposed to flats. But the sable brushes are like 50 bucks a brush. And so in my entire career as an artist, I think I've only ever had one or two of them. I just, I don't think I'm cheap. I just think I, I just think like, that's an awful lot of money to pay for a brush. And do I really need it? And can I get, can I get the same effect without it? And mostly the answer is yes. So um, in terms of acrylic paints, uh, I, I'll use any, just about anything. Um, Liquitex is good. Golden has got a really good reputation. Um, those are the brands that, that are the best. Uh, just stay away from anything student grade at all. If the price is cheaper, there's a reason for it. And it's because they don't put enough pigment into the medium. Uh, and so you end up, you know, having to use 20 coats of paint to get the same opaqueness as you would to, you know, um, one that you maybe paid a little bit more for. It's better to invest in good paints, good brushes, and good canvases, and you will see a big, huge difference in the quality of your work when you do. Um, yeah, stay away from the cheap stuff. It, it's, it's annoying, it's frustrating. You'll, you'll see when you go and buy the good stuff. Save up for it. It's expensive though. It's like, it's as expensive, like there's certain stores I can't go in, and one of them is like a bead store, because I'll come out with beads that I, probably won't use in my lifetime at shoe stores <laughs> I have a thing for shoes and uh and art supply stores and I can't go in there because I always end up you know spending way too much money the art supplies are expensive but once you get a good stock they like they go far you know and and uh, the only thing is care for your brushes really well always pull the paint never push it uh try not get it get your ends all fringy once they get once they sort of fray they're they're no good anymore Unless, of course, you're doing sort of rough, rougher work and, you know, that, that's your style. Okay. Um, I had just one question. I know Kalinda also had this question, more or less. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to do this event tonight was actually because tomorrow is Orange Shirt Day, the day when we mark um, the legacy of residential schools and um, particularly among young people and students and schools. Um, and we wondered if you had any um, thoughts or, or um, words for um, children and youth at this time. Um, I think my thoughts and my words are more for adults than children and youth. And that is, we really do have to get off our phones and social media. You know, we have to spend quality time. Not, I'm not saying people don't, but I'm saying the stresses of the world, our kids pick up on that. They feel that from us. 
And we have to instill hope in the sense of we have to have it ourselves and we have to believe in that. Most of the problems that kids have is because is because of adults. Adults not either, you know, they're, they're not safe or they're not being protected or they're around people who are stressed and frazzled and none of us have enough hours in the day and kids feel that. So my message is mostly when you when you're around children and you're you're laughing and joyous and they're safe and that's what kids need and able to tackle on the problems that we'll face then they don't need to do it now and and also we we have to sort of step up as adults and fight for them otherwise they're going to face uh, worse than than what we have now freedoms will be restricted so we have to guard and protect our freedoms um, with with everything that we have because there will be less for them later on um, children and the only thing I would say for youth and children is if you want to be an artist don't let anybody discourage you um, don't let anything stand in your way. Just pour your heart out into everything that you do. Give it 100%. And um, you know, people will be, people are shitty. People will give you real discouragements. You know, they will, they'll tell you, oh, that's not gonna give you, be a good career for you, or that won't protect you in the future or whatever. But you know, you really do, this is your life, your, your spiritual path. You have to follow your own path, not anybody else's. And, and the other thing is that in terms of Indigenous people, I would say for us, it's really good when youth and children get out to fast, or at least youth. Uh, fasting is a really, really important thing. Uh, we need people to be out fasting and attending ceremonies. So that, that's, and, and learning their languages. So those are, the, those are hard tasks, but I don't, I don't know. Kids, kids have it going on. Kids know what's up. So. <laughs> I, I want to I wanna learn from them rather than me tell them something, you know, like I, I think they can tell us a whole lot rather than the other way around. So um, I know that there's a, a couple other questions that I just saw when I'm looking at the chat and uh, there was one that said, um, where do you store your large canvases when they're not being exhibited? Um, mostly they're stored, uh, they're already um, owned by other institutions or people. And so they go back, they're gonna go back to those places uh, and they have much larger walls than I do. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about that. Um, and then the other ones that I, that I can't store in my house, I, I take them off the frame and I roll them up and they become stored that way. So they get, the larger ones get rolled rather than stay on, this, on the stretcher. Um, a question from Megan Rook, who is a, a lovely ukulele playing youth who I know. And um, it's a great question, Megan. Uh, what do you think of the intersection of art and politics? Do you think it is possible for an artist of any media to remain neutral? Um, I think it's possible for anyone in any vocation to remain neutral if they so choose. Um, and many artists do. You know, there's some artists who are exploring color and that's, that's what they, that's their bag. That's what they'll do. And they still bring beauty into the world by exploring this color and they don't want to be involved in politics or have any sort of position on things. I'm, I'm not in that category. <laughs> I can't help it. But, uh, you know, so I do think it is possible, yep, to remain neutral. I, I, don't, I wouldn't know how myself, but yeah. <laughs> Um, there's also a question. Uh, you spoke a bit about your creative process. Is there anything specific you do for inspiration? Uh, no, I mean, I have a lot of ideas that I will never manifest in my whole life. I will, you know, never be able to fulfill the amount of ideas that I have. And um, so inspiration comes in all sorts of forms. Sometimes it's a reaction to something I don't like and sometimes it's a reaction to things, something I do. And uh, I, I don't know how to say that except that um, 
Yeah, it's just, a, I, I, you know, I don't know where other people get their ideas, but it's just, you get a vibe or a feeling, and you just, uh, that feeling sort of burble, bur gurgles up from the pit of your stomach, and it's almost like you can't stop it, and then you just go for it. So. Okay, it looks like it's about it. Um, gonna... Any questions, uh, Kalinda? Oh, I think... I think that I've had a wonderful time. What a, what, what a lovely Tuesday night um, opportunity for me as well to be holding a little bit of space uh, with you, Christy. It's been great uh, listening to you. I, I'm feeling inspired uh, this evening as well. well. I'd like to thank you both, um, Christy and Kalinda, for being here, um, for, for having this discussion and uh, just very grateful for your generous and thoughtful words tonight and, and the inspiration. So I think a lot of people have noted in their comments how inspiring you are. Um, and I would say both of you are actually. Um, and I would uh, recommend everyone check out Kalinda's, uh, Kalinda Klein's um, book club, uh, Anti-Racism Educator Book Club. <laughs> <laughs> on Wednesday evenings, um, and uh, it's it's a it's a great uh, great content and great conversations there as well. Um, and with that, I will say good evening um, to to you both and to all who attended. Thank you very much for being part of this. Um, I will share all of the comments as I said with Christy, so she has all of that, and we will be sharing the video as well. And we will make sure it gets to educators as well through. Kalinda in particular, because it'll reinforce the um, education package we, we've already created around this exhibition. So, thank you all and uh, have a great night. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And if there was any questions that we didn't get to, I apologize for that. And uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in and of course to Kalinda and John. Thank you so much. Yeah.